Mr. Attorney General, uh, since we're on the, on the subject, I just want to commend you and your department and, of course, those troops who uh, did an unbelievable job, but uh, everyone who uh, played a role in uh, this uh, tremendous operation and uh, bringing uh, bin Laden to justice. So congratulations and thank you. Um, I, I want to get into um, uh, g uh, contractor fraud, uh, which has been a concern of mine for uh, quite a while. And I, I, I've been long concerned that they've been getting kind of a free pass, uh, these contractors, after they commit procurement fraud. And I asked Lanny Brewer a, a number of questions about this back in, in January. Since then, a report by the Department of Defense confirmed some of my uh, suspicions. Uh, over a three-year period, DOD paid $270 billion to more than 91 contractors who were found to be civilly liable for contract fraud, and another $10 billion to an additional 120 contractors who settled civil fraud cases. What is even more astounding is that 30 contractors who were convicted of criminal fraud against the government received another $682 million in contracts from, from DOD after they had been convicted of criminal fraud. Now, I understand that your department is not responsible for making debarment decisions, but do you agree that it's, it's just bizarre that we're awarding billions of dollars in new contracts to entities we know just can't be trusted? It's an interesting question. Um, I know that there, if they are, they are, you know, you have to deal with these things as, as strange as this might sound on a case by case basis. It is sometimes possible that. Um, a company that has done inappropriate things and has been held civilly liable, maybe even criminally liable, um, has, has new management and they've gotten rid of the people who were responsible for the fraud um, it, it, you know, in its previous iteration. And then on that basis, the Department of Defense has made the determination that they can continue to do business with the company. Um, in the absence of some kind of um, remedial steps, though, I would agree with you that it does not make sense to continue to do business with those who have defrauded um, the American people. Well, I, I think there have been cases in which they haven't changed personnel mm -hmm. and that we've just gone right back to it. And I think that's a good idea that we could be debarring CEOs or divisions or heads of divisions or heads of departments uh, of companies where there have been problems and especially uh, uh, where it might not be in our best interest to go after the entire company. Right. But I think that we should be definitely encouraging that and not be going right back to the same people and not requiring that there be a change in, in the people responsible. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree with you. I mean, I mean, you know, the notion that perhaps there'd be some presumptions um, that, have, that perhaps can be overcome by the change, changes that a company has made. One of the things that I would want to make sure is that uh, the government agencies that are involved um, have the maximum amount of flexibility so that um, they can take appropriate um, sanctions when that is necessary, but do it in a way that uh, is consistent with <clears throat> serving the interests of the American people. Well, I'll give you an example. The uh, Department of Health and Human Services recently notified the CEO of Forest Laboratories that it intends to specifically include him right. from doing business with the government, and I think that would force the company to get rid of him. And that follows a large in, in mm -hmm. investigation and settlement of civil and criminal charges related to the sales of antidepressants, and I applaud that approach and think we need to go after individual executives more, especially when there's evidence that they had knowledge of or encouraged this type of misconduct. And unfortunately, though, the uh, tactic of targeting specific ex executives just seems to be very rare, uh, particularly among our larger 
and the largest contracting agencies uh, like the Department of Defense and Department of State, and I fear that most contracting officers are simply not equipped to make some of these decisions and that we should be relying more on inspectors general to lead investigations and make recommendations. What do you think we should, uh, could do to encourage greater coordination between DOJ and the inspector general community on these issues? Well, I, I think we certainly have to communicate. Uh, I think we do a pretty good job of it now uh, to the extent that there are, are problems uh, that you've identified. I certainly want to hear about them and see if there are ways in which we can uh, change our, um, the way in which we uh, communicate with, with the IGs. Um, we have a pretty robust you know, fraud enforcement program, I think a very robust fraud enforcement program. It's a priority uh, matter for us. And we've had, I think, some notable successes, as my written and opening statement have indicated. Um, doesn't mean that we can't do more, and we're not looking for ways in which we can do our job better. Um, the IGs, I think, have a particular, um, have particular strengths in that they know their agencies better than um, outsiders are going to know them. And I would hope that as they identify conduct that is potentially criminal, that they are making sure they refer that um, information to the Justice Department so that we can take uh, appropriate enforcement actions, whether it is civil um, or, or criminal. I'd also say that with regard to your point about looking at individuals, um, that, that is something that we have to do. This can't simply be seen as the cost of doing business, that you, know, you defraud the United States, you pay a big fine, right. and then you continue to interact with the, the government and um, continue to get contracts, and no harm befalls anybody except maybe the shareholders because this company has had to pay the government a huge amount of money. To the extent that we can identify individuals who are responsible for these actions, um, it is my instruction, it is our intent uh, to hold them accountable, to hold them individually um, liable for, for these actions. I, I think that would incentivize uh, not committing fraud, right. which I think is a good thing. Yeah, I, 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 the people behind bars tends to uh, stick in, uh, in individuals' minds as opposed to the notion that, well, my company is simply going to have to pay you know, or, I mean, I'm not even necessarily talking behind bars, just, oh, this is career ending. That, that also catches people's attention. I, I want to touch on something uh, and, and then let you go, because I'm the only thing between you and, and going. Um, and and so, something that uh, Senator Blumenthal talked about, which is the uh, Sony PlayStation and Epsilon, Epsilon. Da data breaches, uh, which have shown us all this month how vulnerable our private information is online. Uh, and among those companies affected by the Epsilon breach were several Minnesota companies, as well as oh, many, many Minnesota customers. Uh, a few weeks ago, I wrote a letter to Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer again asking if our current anti-hacking laws are strong enough to deter hackers. So I want to really ask about uh, two questions. The first is, does the Department of Justice have any recommendations to update or strengthen these anti-hacking laws, including the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, within that? Uh, Senator, what I'd like to do is maybe get in touch with our experts and ask them that question and put something in writing for you with regard to suggestions that we might have. I will say that with regard to both the Epsilon matter and the Sony matter, they are currently under investigation in the uh, Department of Justice. Right, and thank you for that. Uh, this is a slightly different question, but it, it uh, should those who have these da data uh, be required to protect those data? Because it's one thing, we're talking about anti-hacking, the per people that hacked into Sony, the people that hacked into Epsilon. But shouldn't Epsilon and Sony have some requirement? And there are a lot of third parties who have a lot of data and they can get hacked into. In, in, in updating our privacy laws, is there possibly a role uh, to require, and maybe it's, I'm not sure whether you do this by law or regulatory function, to require them to have a protocol 
to secure this data in a way that can't be hacked or that is state of the art. So, I mean, because if, if you have all this data and you're, um, if there's no requirement to have a certain level of security, it seems like we're inviting hacking. As I indicated to um, <clears throat> Senator Blumenthal, I, I actually think that the idea that you're raising is, is a good one, and maybe there's a way in which um, this committee, um, the Justice Department, other involved federal agencies and industry can get together and look at that issue, because I really do think that the focus has to be on prevention. That is the way in which you, right. you offer the maximum protection to, um, con to consumers, um, not after the horse is out of the, the barn where we are doing what we can to enforce the laws and hold people responsible, but to prevent people from suffering um, the loss of their identities, their um, financial information. And, and so I would pledge to work um, with you or any group that you put together. That would uh, be great. I'm uh, the chairman of a new subcommittee on, on privacy and technology and the law, and uh, I would Take, I'll, I'll take you up on that. Good. Okay, uh, and and uh, I'll let you go. So, uh, Attorney General Holder, I want I just want to thank you for your time, uh, for your testimony, for your service. Um, and we always appreciate appreciate hearing from you and um, learning all about what uh, what's going on at the Department of Justice. Thank you again. Uh, for being here and the record of this hearing will be kept open for a week. This meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Senator. Thank you.